John. Yes, sir. Um, we were studying 1 Samuel 4, and verses 18 and 19 seem to be, uh, this is dealing, you know, with uh, Sam, uh, well, the death of Eli uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, Eli, uh, it says in verse 18 in English, it says, um, oh boy, I'm, my light is getting dark here. <laughs> ah, 18. As soon as he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair opposite the site of the city gate breaking his neck and he died for the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel for 40 years mm -hmm. and goes into his daughter-in-law passing away as well, giving birth. Uh, and when in that verse, there's a, a, ver, a word that uh, it looks like it, uh, it's about the only place it's ever used. Um, Mafrakto. Mafrakto. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's let's put the verse on screen for everybody to see, so we can everybody can see what what is the word you're talking about, which is a hapax legomenon, right? We've talked about that. Uh, let's see. I hope people remember what a, what a hapax legomenon is. But first of all, I'll put it on screen. Okay. So we're talking about 1 Samuel 4, verse 18, guys. And soon enough, it will be on screen. Okay. Okay. Bear with me. Um, and yeah. So let's put it here. Uh, the the I guess the question that I was having was this: uh, the my Tanakh says as soon as he mentioned the Ark of God, and uh, uh, when we were reading it, uh, someone was translating it as as he was remembering the Ark. Okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no. Uh, Okay, we'll talk about it. It's it's a good good question. And okay. Can you see the verse now, guys? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's uh let's have this verse read. Uh, any brave volunteers? Nancy, would you like to read this? Oh, I can give it a try. Excellent. Um, that's that's you know what, maybe, what I'm maybe with. Just, maybe we should just read the first three lines. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Vayahi kehaz ki ro et aron ha Elohim. Vayahifo. That's going to be yeah. Vayipol me al ha kesev aharanit bead yad hashe shef er. Hashaar. Hashaar. Yeah, that's right. It's a hak. Hashaar. Vatish. No, vatisha ver. Or ver. Is it ver? Vatishaver. Vatishaver. Mafrak. To. Vayam. Vayam mot. Vayam mot. Maybe someone else would like to read Okay. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can take the, the fourth line as well because it's still the same half of the verse. Okay. Apatiti okay. at So. Go ahead. I hear Kiza. Yeah, Kiza Ken. 
right? That's the first half of this verse. The halves do not have to be like of equal length. And like I... the second half uh, of this verse, uh, Don, would you like to read the second half? I will give it a very <laughs> effort. Vahu shef pot chaf chafta et Israel are ayum ayim shana. Right. Vahu shafat et Israel are ayim shana. So, a few things. Uh, first of all, you've asked about the word mafrakto, uh, which is a hapax legomenon. Guys, do you remember what's a hapax legomenon? Only happened once. Yes, very good. Excellent, Miranda. Only, uh, uh, only said once, basically. Only a word that appears only once in a certain corpus. Okay, it, this is a hapax legomenon in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we've talked about the, the fact that in, in when discussing the Hebrew, discussing what is a hapax legomenon is a little bit more complicated because you have different roots. But nonetheless, the word mafrakto uh, is, is some, some part of his head. So... Today, we tend to, we understand it as, as kind of the neck, okay? That's the uh, uh, mafreket, okay? The, the neck, when you break someone's neck, uh, that's the uh, mafreket. It might be actually, uh, it might be, there are suggestions to understand this actually as the crown of the head not the neck. But nonetheless, it is either the neck, which this is how it is understood uh, in, in modern Hebrew, but also in, in among many uh, other commentators of the Bible. There are suggestions that uh, suggest that this is not the, uh, not the neck, but rather the top of the head. The Septuagint talks about breaking his back. So uh, you can, you know, there are different understanding as to what it is because it is not a word that appears many times in the Bible. The root, pei, reish, and kof, has to do with, um, with dividing or um, some kind of breaking or dividing, okay? Uh, it should be said that generally verbs that have pay and reish as the first two root letters may have a different uh, third root letter such as dalet, kof, tet, reish. They all have to do with or samech, okay, or tzadi. Okay, these are all have to do with some kind of separation, division. When they have a uh, slightly different meaning as nuances. So for instance, pei, reish, and reish has to do with crumbling. Uh, pei, reish, and samech has to do with cutting into pieces. Peresh and Dalet has to do with separation. Peresh and Tzadik has to do with breaching. But you can see that there is most probably a biconsonantal background to all of these verbs. Okay. Essentially, there is a theory that many of the roots of the Hebrew, which contain how many Consonants, how many consonants do we have in a Hebrew root? Three. Three. So, very good. So, many of these triconsonantal roots go back to a biconsonantal 
primitive root, if you will. And so you can see how verbs or roots containing pei resh and then another letter have some kind of a common semantic field. Okay, so the word mafrakto provides us with pei resh and kof, okay, which has to do with kind of dividing as, as well, okay? By the way, the word perek, perek, again, not in biblical Hebrew, but in post-biblical Hebrew means chapter. Okay? So the word chapter, perek, uh, in biblical Hebrew, in, in post-biblical Hebrew, um, and, and that's mafrakto, either, as we said, the top of the head, based on the comparison to Syriac, the neck, as understood by most commentators, or the back, according to the Septuagint. And they all have to make sense, you know, because he falls backwards. So either the top, the neck, the back, you get the, the situation. Now, another question you had is about the word kehazkiro, right? Which is here on screen, I'll clean the mess we did with the word mafrakto, and now we can talk about the word kehazkiro. And you said that someone read it mentioned, and another one said when he remembered, right? Correct, yes. Correct. Was he actually reading a translation or translating it himself? He was translating it himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did I guess? Because <laughs> we're experts, <laughs> we're inexperienced. <laughs> uh, I don't want to say inexperienced, but I can see what was the process going through his mind. Uh, indeed, the root Zain Kofen, Zain Kafen Reish has to do with remembering. So I can see where he came from. However, the binyan here, what is the binyan of this infinitive form, guys? If so. It's a he feel. Okay, so the specific meanings of, of the verb are diversified or varied by the binyan in which it is used. In the he feel, this root has to do with either reminding that which is causing to remember, thus reminding, mentioning, or even invoking. Moreover, so that's first of all, based on the morphology of the word, why it is not when he remembered, but rather when he reminded or invoked or mentioned cause to remember. The he feel oftentimes has a causative sense. So when you go back to your friend whose name is Tony. <laughs> Tony, shout out to Tony. Tony, look, this is a he feel verb. Okay? The he feel is a causative, thus causing to remember. That's one, just based on the morphology. But we don't have just morphology to serve us in the understanding, the overall understanding of the Bible. We also have context. What is the end of verse 17? Mm. You don't need the Bible for that, guys. You have verse 18 before you. I'm sure you can remember. The or news came in that his two sons were dead. Yes. And, uh, the, the, the ark was uh, captured. Right. So the, verse 17 ends with the fact that the ark of the covenant or the ark of God specifically was taken. And verse 18, and it happened, ke has kiro, the kaf as a preposition before an infinitive. What is the use of the cuff before an infinitive, guys? Uh, 
let me give you an example. When Esau um, comes to get his blessing from his father, Isaac, he hears, you know, he comes to his father and he says, oh, I'm Esau. And his father says, oh, what do you mean? Uh, someone was here. Your brother came and deceitfully took your blessing. And then the Bible says, Kishmoa Esav. Again, using the kaf as a preposition before an infinitive. Kishmoa Esav et divrei aviv. The kaf as a preposition before an infinitive oftentimes suggests the inception. Okay? And not just when, when is okay. But a better translation for the cuff as a preposition before an infinitive is often as soon as. Oh, yeah. So as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with a very bitter uh, cry. As soon as he mentioned, invoked, reminded, in the sense that he said it, Okay, as soon as he invoked, as soon as he mentioned the Ark of the of God, which is exactly the last thing mentioned in the previous verse, then he fell backwards and so forth. So you see, Tony, why it should be mentioned, invoked, and not remembered? Okay. Okay. Thank you. I um and I don't, I don't know if Tony will hear this, but I uh, hope. Sure, I'll either. put it on my YouTube channel, and you'll send him the link, and he will be able to see that. Well, we we did kind of go over it a little bit in our group, and uh, and I was just uh, going over it again to get a more uh, in depth clarification, I guess. Right. So excellent. Um, very good, guys. You should all keep groups where you read Hebrew or teach Hebrew even. You can, everybody here is, can teach the Hebrew alphabet or teach reading or teach Hebrew in their respective levels. And I promise you, you can come here with the difficulties and I'll help you. You know, whatever, you know, needs you have as, as you're establishing your your study groups, I will help you. I will back you up. You'll always have someone to come with your questions. Okay, so that's... I do have an understanding question uh, about uh, verse 9, just above that. And I'm, I'm inquiring as to who would be the one that is making this statement. Um, I, what comes to my mind is... Uh, 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 the, the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart, and he did it by getting Pharaoh to continue with his, uh, his, his path that he had chosen. And I was thinking that this is perhaps the manner that was happening here, that they, the, the Philistines are being encouraged to, to continue in their, their uh a task, uh, or, I guess. It's yes, yes, yes. I want to, uh, first of all, it is the, the Philistines kind of, uh, it's a pep rally of the Philistines, if you will, right? When, when so it, like, would the leaders, it would be the five leaders that are saying, I, I don't know who them. among those leaders, but it is someone there uh, answering the preceding verse, verse 8 which expresses a great fear, or uh, verses, uh, verses 7 and 8, which present great fear among the Philistines. And verse 9 is talking about, you know, let's be strong, let's not be afraid, let's uh, strengthen ourselves. I think it has to do with generally uh, understanding that the ark of God is not God, okay? People have, uh, and that is related to the general message that we see across different stories in the books of Samuel, not just here, but you know, 
it's it's trying to teach us the readers through the ordeals or through those stories containing the ark of god what is the place of the ark of god and what is not and every time people think it's a mag magical uh solution for their problems they they understand it is not okay so and yet with this same story you know uh while the Philistines capture it, they are put in great discomfort as a result of it. So it, right. there is authority and power associated with it. And then when it comes back to... But you the, cannot the, harvest it. It's not that you can use it as you will. That's the message of, of both these stories. And, and generally the stories of, of, the, Ark of the, uh, the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant in the books of Samuel. So you had to respect it. Yes. Uh, very good. Next question, guys. Thank you for the question. You see, uh, you, you brought a very interesting discussion. We talked about biconsonantal roots. We've talked about different uh, binyanim and how they, they interact with, you know, they, they uh, reflect different voices, okay, of the verb. And we've talked about the cuff as a preposition before the infinitive expressing the inception of the action, the beginning of the action, as soon as rather than just when. So thank you for the question. <laughs>